Let's pray. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah, the man of war, your mercy endureth forever and ever. Oh, praise his holy name. Amen. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jehovah, the man of God, your mercy endureth forever and ever. Oh, praise his holy name. Amen. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, 
Jehovah, the man of war, your mercy and your earth forever and ever. Oh, praise his holy name. King of kings and Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is the one who was, the one who is to come, the Almighty, we bless your holy name. Thank you for giving us another Sunday. Thank you for keeping us alive to this moment. Thank you because your word is forever settled. Thank you because your promises are here and amen. Thank you because we can rely on you for safety even in the time of storms. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Today, Lord God Almighty, send your word to your children. Let the power in your word heal. Let the power in your word set free. Let miracles, signs, and wonders happen in the lives of all your children all over the world today. At the end of everything, let your name be glorified, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Well, let someone shout hallelujah. Well, uh, I'm coming to you today again uh, from the studio of Dove Media. I have a very special message for all of you. And I believe that um, I might be coming to you again and again for the next couple of weeks till all the storms are over. I will be talking to you from Psalm 91, reading from verse 1 to 10. Psalm 91 from verse 1 to 10. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flyeth by day, nor for the, waste, the, for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee. Only with thy eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation, there shall no evil before thee, neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. I'm, I'm sure that as I was reading, you must be shouting amen along with me. Now before I go to the message proper, I have a word for you, those of you who are my children. At the beginning of the year, I asked you to fast for 50 days. And you fasted. You didn't ask me why. But you fasted because you trust me. Good. Now, with the same trust, I want you to go ahead and relax. No problems for you. No plague is coming near you. You can take the word of God from me to you. Relax. Be at peace. I will explain as I go along, but I just want you to breathe freely, relax. 
If you didn't fast, when I ask you to fast, it's not too late yet. Begin your own fast. <laughs> but when you are fasting, there were people who are mocking you, who are saying, ah, what kind of church do you attend? You fasted in November. Now you are fasting again in January. When are you going to enjoy? Now is your time to enjoy. Relax. Because all is going to be well with you. I can assure you that. Now, I also want to tell you one thing. Which is, how would they say it, for your ears only. At the beginning of the year, when I was giving you the prophecies concerning the new year, I did tell you that God said that this year the world will behave like a child in convulsion. I'm sure you remember I told you that. I announced that because I assume that that means there will be earthquakes, there will be volcanoes, there will be floods, there will be fire, there will be tornadoes and hurricanes and all kinds of natural disaster. But there was something extra he said, which I couldn't tell you then, and I will tell you the reason I couldn't tell you. He told me loud and clear that this year, the whole world is going to be on compulsory holiday. <laughs> when I heard that one, that was difficult to explain. I, I know the last time we got close, we didn't get there, we got close to the world being on holidays was after 9-11. You remember when there was this attack in America on the um, World Trade Center towers? that all planes were grounded, at least around America. So when he says the whole world is going to be on holidays, compulsory holiday, I thought maybe something like that is going to happen. Like it happened during 9-11. Now if that is what he meant, and somebody had prophesied it, when it occurs, <laughs> the interpol will come and get the fellow and say, you heard about the plot. You knew when they were planning this thing and you didn't speak. So I kept my mouth shut. But now, the compulsory holiday is here. You can see the major nations of the world Locking down. Uh, <laughs> and even the smaller nations are also going to be locked down. You know why? Because nobody wants to travel now by air. <laughs> because if you travel by air, so you board a plane, and there's just one fellow in that play who is infected, and they are going to look for you and put you on quarantine or whatever they call it. Compulsory holiday. Because my daddy says he wants to show the world that he's still the one in control. He wants to show those of us who think we are someone that heaven is still his throne and the whole earth is full stool. So if you think you are big, well, it's going to compel you to sit down at home and not move, at least for two weeks. Now the good news about that is this. As soon as he has achieved his purpose, as soon as he had proved to the whole world that he can shut down the 
all earth. If he wants, and then he will remove the plague. How long before that happens? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. But uh, from the look of things, he's already achieving his purpose. If he stops the plague now, the world by now should know <laughs> that there is someone called the Almighty. Now, when you look at some of the steps that have been taken by governments all over the world, uh, you will probably be laughing. <laughs> because they're very funny. If it has not been a very tragic situation, they will be very ridiculous. I mean, for example, in our nation here, Nigeria, uh, instructions have gone out. People should not gather more than 50 people in any place. Very good. And, of course, I've given you instructions that we must obey everything that comes from the government. But how is that funny? Have you ever been to a bus stop? How many people do you find there? Even as I'm speaking to you, how many people are at any bus stop, say Unibo, or any of the bus stops? 50? 100? What are you going to do about those who go to the market in Unibo Market, for example? <laughs> How many people gather at Unibo Market at any particular time? Now, as if that is not funny enough. We close down schools, close down universities, which is uh, according to the wisdom of uh, the government. Okay, no problem. But ask yourself the question. In the campus, they are in a secluded community. I mean, unless somebody comes from abroad, to the campus, which is most unlikely. Those who are in the campuses are secure. They know we must send them out to, to where the problems are. And we say for security of the students. Very interesting. It brings you to the question. What about those in prison? Are we going to release all the prisoners so they can go home? Like, uh, I think, uh, is this Saudi Arabia or Iran? I think it's Iran who said he, he released about 850 or so thousand prisoners temporarily. The whole thing would have been Funny, if it had not been so tragic. But God says the whole world will have compulsory holiday. So, my children, enjoy your rest. Enjoy your public holiday declared from heaven. But you have nothing to worry about. You have fasted, you have prayed. And Oh, but I know some of you have some questions, you know, particularly those of you who are very highly intelligent. And you say, ah, but if God wants to do this, uh, must he use a plague? Uh, don't we believe that it is Satan who is the author of sickness and disease? Oh, sure, he is. But who controls Satan? Read Job chapter 2. Before Satan can put sickness on Job, he had to get permission from God. 
And those of you who have attended the school of disciples, who have learned, were taught you years ago, that when we ask the question, why doesn't God just wipe out Satan so that he will stop causing problems in the world? I told you that he's keeping Satan alive because Satan can still be useful. <laughs> and then some of you will say, but so many people are dying. Oh, somebody did a research not too long ago. Considering the number of people who died in the first quarter of 2020, you will be amazed that the number of people that malaria had killed is more than five times those people that uh, coronavirus has killed. The number of people that had died by accident in the first three years of the, month of the year, three, three months of the year, the number of people who died by accident far, far, far exceed those who are killed by coronavirus, etc., etc. You see, what makes coronavirus interesting is that it is noisy. It is called the noisy pestilence. It's making so much noise. And it's making this noise for a purpose. God must get the attention of the whole world. He, God has declared compulsory holiday. And the good news is, like I said, as soon as he has proved his point, mm, coronavirus will subside. Subside, though. Not die. Uh, now, I've had some prophets giving prophecies. <laughs> Better work on the pastor say if the prophets have spoken. Uh, I heard that one prophet says uh, by the 27th of March, coronavirus will be dead. I say, Amen. What can the pastor say? I heard that one prophet said that rain will fall seven days nonstop, and that rain will wipe out coronavirus. I said, Amen. A prophet is greater than a pastor. So what's going to happen to coronavirus? You want to hear? Because I'm talking to you, my children. This is a classified information. <laughs> it will subside. It will go into the background just like Ebola, just like uh, all, all, all the other plagues that have been around. It will go into the background and uh, hopefully it will stay in the background if God will, does not need it again, but that it will die. <laughs> Let me say it in our local something, not lie. It has come, and it has come to stay. The next time the people of the world tries to show the Almighty God that they are greater than Him, He knows what to do. But for you, my children, Ah, relax. There's no problem for you. Oh, concerning hygiene, I'm 100% in support. I mean, you know, we had always been very, very strong when it comes to sanitation. You know what we do during our conventions when we have <laughs> millions of people gathered together? You know, every night of the convention, we speak on sanitation. And anybody who scored less than 90% uh, cleanliness, we call out their names. You, you know very well. So maintain that strict hygiene that we treat as our own custom. Maintain it at home. Not just during this uh, uh, pandemic or whatever name they want to call it, but for the rest of your life. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Our God is holy. Our God is pure. So maintain strict hygiene. On the issue of saying uh, you must be 
uh, so many meters from one another. <laughs> Again, that's one of the funny things I see in the actions being taken by men. Because those who are telling us to do that, when I watch them on television, I see one minister sitting next to another minister. <laughs> see? And I try to measure the distance between one minister and the other. And it's less than the distance they say we should observe. But then, man must be man. And of course, we are men. I want to congratulate all the governments for all the actions they have taken. They've tried within human ability. May the Almighty God bless them all. The only thing is that whether they know it or not, they are just playing to the hand of the Almighty God. They will be, the whole world will be on complete holidays. And the holidays are already starting from all the major nations of the world, particularly those nations who boast of their uh, ability to tackle problems. Uh, God bless them all. God bless them all. Now, I want to talk to you now very briefly from the passage I read to you, Psalm 91. Uh, uh, by the way, um, don't be surprised that there will be those who will mock they have been mocking us for saying we pray. They, uh, they mock the efficacy of prayers. Um, just pray for them. Because those who mock prayers are mocking God. Because the Bible says clearly, O thou that hearest prayers, unto thee shall all flesh come. So anybody mocking prayer is mocking the one who hears prayers. And you should pray for them. Don't get angry with them. They need prayers. They need the mercy of God. Why? Because the elders have a saying. The mouth that the snail has used to blaspheme God. That mouth is going to lick the ground. Uh, so pray for them. You shouldn't be angry. They, 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 they will mock more. I've, I've, what I'm saying to you now, oh, when you hear them react, it will be funny. Let them react. You, the important thing is you are safe, which is the, secure, the security that I'm interested in. Now, reading Psalm 91, I want to preach to you a sermon that I think I preached sometimes in 1980-something when the, there was... Uh, a crisis of a different nature than like this to encourage my people. And today I will probably just have enough time with uh, verse 1. And if God permits, then I will come back to you again, maybe next Sunday, and I might continue from where I live off today. Or if he gives me another message for you, I will do that. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I told them then, almost 40 years ago, number one, there is someone called the Most High. And that's my God. That's the God I serve. In Isaiah 66 verse 1, Isaiah 66 verse 1, it tells us that Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. His throne is the highest one. So if anybody thinks that uh, he's high, well, let's compare his own throne, which is still on earth, and if his throne is on, that, is, is on earth, then that throne is on that, the footstool. My father is stepping on his throne. His own throne is in heaven. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 8, Ecclesiastes 5 verse 8 calls him the one who is higher than the highest. He says, if you see somebody who thinks he's high and there's someone who thinks he's higher than that, he says, there is someone higher than them all. Ephesians chapter 1 
if we read it from verse 18 to 22, Ephesians 1, verse 18 to 22, particularly verse 21, says his throne is far above all principalities, all powers, all might, all dominion, all kingdom. And you know who that person is? His name is Jesus. Because in Philippians chapter 2, from verse 9 to 11, Philippians 2, 9 to 11, the Bible says God has given him a name that is above every other name, whether in heaven, on earth, or underneath the earth. And I remember I told them this story so many years ago. I told them of the story of four boys who were uh, playing somewhere in Asurok. And as usual, for boys, when boys gather together, they begin to boast about their parents. And the, the, the son of the president said to the remaining three, and said, of course, you all know that my father is the greatest. And they all said, why? Said, ah, <laughs> my father is the number one man in the, state, in the country, so my father is the greatest. Oh, the second one said, no, my father is greater than your father. He said, ah, how? He said, because my father is your father's physician. If he commands your father to stay in bed for one week, president or no president, he must obey. And the third one said, <laughs> but my father is greater than your two fathers. And the, uh, the other said, how can that be? A boy said, you all know my father is your father's uh, witch doctor, your father's herbalist. He can kill your fathers. Uh, and nobody will know who did it. And then the fourth boy, who happens to be the son of a messenger in, the, in Nazareth, says, but my father is greater than all your father. <laughs> they all looked at him and they said, ah, you? <laughs> yeah, we know your father. your father. Your father is a messenger. I said, no, you don't know my father. I'm not talking of my father here on earth. I'm talking of my father in heaven. He cannot only kill, he can raise the dead. His name is Jesus. And this, point number two, this person that is called the Most High has a secret place. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Psalm 27 verse 5. Psalm 27 verse 5 says, In the time of trouble, in a time like this, he shall hide me in the secret of his tabernacle. This God, he has a pavilion, he has a secret place where he hides those who are precious to him in the time of trouble. Psalm 61, from verse 3 to 4, Psalm 61 from verse 3 to 4, talks about him. He said, thou hast been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. He has a secret place. When there is trouble, and that's where he hides his own. And you know what? That secret place is not the vestry of a church. It's not any special place. That secret place is a name. The name of Jesus. Because if that secret place happens to be maybe the vestry of a church or the special altar, then what happens when you are traveling? And suddenly you come face to face with trouble. Psalm 18, sorry, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. Proverbs 18, verse 10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. And that name is Jesus. I remember I told them a testimony at that time of one of my daughters who was doing her youth service in Port Harcourt. She was traveling from Lagos to Port Harcourt. At that time, the highway from the west to, uh, or, uh, and to Benin 
was just made and it was good. So vehicles could travel at, oh, breakneck speed. And so as he was traveling in this uh, Peugeot station wagon, she was sitting at the, at the back, you know, you know, the station wagon, sit in front, sit in the middle, sit at the back. She was one of those sitting at the back. When all of a sudden, at high speed, the front tire burst. And the car began to somersault. As the car was doing the first somersaulting, she shouted, Jesus. And the window of the car opened. And an unseen set of hands picked her up at the back, brought her out of the window, sat her by the highway side, and she watched as if she was watching a horror film as the car continued to somersault. The car somersaulted five times before landing on its back. When people came, because as, as the accident happened, all other vehicles stopped. When they came and they saw the horrors, and they saw a girl sitting by the roadside, they wonder, what are you doing here? She said, I came out of that car. <laughs> Nobody could believe it. He said, you are, you are joking. He said, I was reading my Bible. When the accident happened, my Bible is still there. This is my name. Go. They went and they saw the Bible. And they saw that it had the same name as the girl sitting by the roadside. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it. And he said, do, do I hear somebody shout Jesus loud and clear? And then point number three. This same someone who is called the Most High, is also called the Almighty. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Genesis 17, verse 1, the first time God introduced himself to man, he said, was talking to Abraham, and he said, I am the Almighty God. <laughs> Psalm 62, verse 11. Psalm 62, verse 11 says, God has spoken once. Twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. And I mean power, real power. That makes him the almighty. In Jeremiah 32 verse 27, Jeremiah 32 verse 27, to, to show you how mighty he is, he said, behold, I'm the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? And the answer came in the same Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Just in case you don't know how to answer that question. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. He said, oh, Lord God, you've made the heavens, you've made the earth, and there's nothing too hard for you. In Luke chapter 1, verse 37, Luke 1, verse 37, it is written, For with God nothing shall be impossible. That's the meaning of Almighty. And again, to prove to you that this one who is the Most High is also the one who is the Almighty, if you read Matthew 28, verse 18, Matthew 28, verse 18, the Bible says, Jesus came to them and said, All power. In heaven and on earth has been given unto me all power. I remember I told them at that time the testimony of uh, one of my sons. I told them uh, after my wife and I got married, the first three children were done by cesarean operations because the doctor said that certain bones were bent somewhere and that she cannot deliver uh, naturally. So after three children, we said, that's enough, we better stop. Then we became born again. 
And then one day I was reading Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Doctors may say impossible. Uh, the laws of nature might say impossible. But with God, nothing shall be impossible. And I told my wife, we're going to have another child. Because, but for the problem, <laughs> I love children so much that uh, I probably would have had 12. To cut a long story short, my wife became pregnant. And uh, all, all my friends, all my relatives told me, please don't kill your wife. Uh, for, uh, at that time now, I was, we were not even going to any hospital anymore. I had a, an uncle who was a specialist surgeon, and he spoke to me. I said, "Listen, I know you have accepted this religion, and you, and in those days they would say I accepted a little bit of madness with it." He said, "Let me tell you the truth. Let me tell you the truth as it is." He said, "If the baby is extremely small." and manages to come out one way or the other. He said, your wife has been sutured three places inside. During labor, at least one of the suturing will rupture, and your wife will bleed to death. <laughs> I smiled. I said, sir, that's not written in the Bible. What is written is that with God, nothing shall be Impossible. Anyway, to cut a long story short, some of you know the story. Uh, my wife came. I mean, my wife, the day came for my wife to deliver. She gave birth to my son. And he was uh, the biggest boy we ever had since then. I remember that a week after that one, I had a meeting with uh, some student doctors at Luth. They had a retreat. And... And I shared the testimony with them. They, 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 their mouths were open. They couldn't believe what I was selling them. And then one of my friends, who is a scientist, said to me, well, uh, uh, Dr. Deboe, you, you, you are a scientist. You know that uh, nothing is proved scientifically until it can be repeated. Ah, OK. <laughs> so we went ahead and repeated it. And I got another baby, which is bigger than the first one, just to show the, <laughs> to show the world that there is someone called the Almighty. And you know what? His name is Jesus. And that Almighty is on your side. So let me hear you shout, Jesus, again. And then point number four. This one called the Almighty has a shadow. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Mosai shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 36 verse 7. Psalm 36 verse 7 says, How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Psalm 57 verse 1. Psalm 57 verse 1. Say, be merciful unto me, O Lord. In the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge. Until all these calamities be overpassed. We have a shadow where we can make our refuge. Isaiah 25 verse 4, Isaiah 25 verse 4 says, For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the lindy in distress, a refuge from storm, a shadow from the heat. When the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall, the Almighty has a shadow. And you know what that shadow is? Jesus. Psalm 121 verse 5. Psalm 121 verse 5 says, The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. 
So I remember I told them the story then of three fishes. Some of you probably heard the story, at least the older ones. Living in an ocean. And in that ocean, there was a mother shark and a baby shark, and they loved to eat fish. So these three fishes, and I call them fishes because they have different species, just in case you want to check my grammar. So these three fishes uh, had a prayer meeting. You know they, are, they must be very special. And they called the Lord to come down. Lord, come. We want to talk to you. And so the Lord came to their prayer meeting. And the Lord said, okay, so what do you want? Oh, the first fish says, Lord, there are sharks troubling us here. What I want is that I want you to give me eyes all over my body. I want all my scales to become eyes. Why? So if the sharks are coming from behind, I will see them before they can get near. If they are coming from right or left, I have eyes everywhere. Hmm. And I say, is that what, what you want? You say, yes. Okay. Turn to the second fish. What do you want? The second fish say, I want two powerful wings. Why? So that if the sharks could come after me, I will fly out of the water. They, they can fly. And the Lord said, okay. Turn to the third fish. Fish number three. What do you want? The fish number three said, all I want is that everywhere I go, you go with me. That's all I want. Okay. So the Lord said, fine. So the Lord left. As soon as he left, the fish who wanted eyes suddenly had eyes all over her body. The one who wanted a pair of wings, strong wings, too. The third fish remained just as ordinary as before. Soon after the shark, the mother shark and the baby shark were hunting. And they saw the fish with many eyes. They said, hey, what a beautiful fish. And they began to go after it. But he saw them long before they came near. So he swam towards the beach. And when he got close to the beach, he saw a pool of water in the sand on the beach. And because he could see ahead of everybody, he made a big jump and landed in the pool of water. And from there, he began to laugh at the uh, shark and the baby shark. You come, come and come and get me here. But soon the sun rose, and the little water on the beach dried up, and the fish with many eyes died. When the mother shark and the baby shark found that they lost the fish with uh, many eyes, they turned around and they saw the second fish. And they began to move towards that one, and that one flew out of the ocean and began to laugh at the shark and the baby shark and said, if you want to get me, you have to come to the air. But soon, an eagle was passing overhead, and he looked down. I said, what am I seeing? A fish in my domain? Oh, Lord, how kind you are. I had always wanted to eat fish, only I couldn't swim. Now you have brought one to me. And so the fish ended up as lunch for the eagle. And then the baby shark said to the mother shark, Hey, there is a tall fish here. And he doesn't even seem to be afraid of us. He's just swimming about. Hey, let's go and get him. And the mother shark said to the baby shark, are you blind? Can't you see that everywhere this fish is going, there's the shadow of a man following him? You get close to that fish, the man whose shadow you see will kill you. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. My children, you might not see him, but he's by your side. He's taking care of you. That's where no plague is going to come near you at all. 
Now, let's begin to conclude. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The condition for abiding in this blessing, in this security, is that you must dwell. He that dwells shall abide. You cannot afford to be a Sunday, Sunday Christian. Not only at a time like this, but for the rest of your life. Because you must dwell under the shadow of the Almighty for you to abide. Psalm 23, verse 6. Psalm 23, verse 6. David said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And what will I do? Oh, he said, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So if you are one of those people who come in to God when you need a miracle and then move out, and then you'll be in trouble. Uh, this one, you, you know this story, I'm sure, but I've told you this one before. They brought a man to the church at Ebutemeta several years ago. When he came, he had this strange illness. None of the joints can bend. So the hands were stiff as a rock. The legs, stiff as a rock. Everything stiff. He couldn't, he couldn't kneel down. He couldn't do, if to, to get up at all, if he should lie down, it will require people to pick him up again. We prayed a simple prayer. And the Almighty God healed him. He was able to kneel. He was able to lift his hand. He was able to clap. And we all rejoiced. For about two weeks, he kept coming to church. And we were all singing together, rejoicing together. Then after some time, we didn't see him. So we decided to follow him up. When we got there, brother, we, we have not seen you in church for a couple of Sundays. What happened? He said, ah, what do you mean, what happened? When you go to the hospital and you are well, <laughs> don't you come back home? I came to your church. God healed me. Is it your church that healed me? We said, no, sir. God healed me. And that's why I'm back home. But God said we shouldn't forsake the assembly of God. He said, eh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I came, you played your part, I'm back home. Hmm. Couple of months or so later, either months or weeks, because the man was living somewhere in Yaba, and at that time I was working at the University of Lagos. I was driving to the campus. And I saw the same man coming. This time, the hands were back. The same way it was when he came. The legs were back. He had to be walking uh, with the legs wide apart. And this time around, even the mouth can close. He decided not to dwell. And so, the blessing was taken away from him. In conclusion, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You might be listening to me now, you might not yet be a child of God. <laughs> At a time like this, you are in very serious danger, physically. Because at a time like this, when the Almighty God will be moving around, when the plague is moving around, there is a passage in the Bible that God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When the angel of death sees the blood, it will pass over you. If you are not yet washed in the blood of the Lamb, 
If you are not yet saved, if your sins are not yet gone, you better run to Jesus now. This is not the time to joke because the Bible says the righteous is taken out of trouble. The wicked goes instead. This is a time of trouble for those who are not in Christ. I appeal to you, surrender your life to Jesus Christ now. So where you are over there, stand immediately, go to the altar, and the man of God there will direct you as to what you should do. The rest of us, let's get up and talk to the Almighty God and thank Him. Your, your prayer should be mainly thanksgiving. Thank Him for the salvation of your soul. Thank Him that He has washed you in His blood. Thank you that you had been obedient to Him thus far. And call on Him and say, Lord, just keep me safe. Keep me under the shadow of Thy wings and I will serve you for the rest of my life. The Almighty God will grant your request today. He will answer your prayer by fire. God bless you all.